So today's event is going to be divided into three sections as we are having three speakers. Um, the start is going to make Oscar, our CEO. He's going to talk about the research we're doing at Panacea. And give you a bit of an introduction to Skeleton ID, which is a product we're developing for forensic experts. After that, uh, Ruben, our anthropologist, is going to talk about the craniofacial superimposition module for Skeleton ID. Um, and he's actually going to show you live how to use Skeleton ID for forensic identification. So there's going to be a little demo included in the whole thing. And after that, Andrea, one of our senior researchers, is going to talk about well, the future, I guess, <laughs> uh, which is our research and what we currently have in the pipeline. And I believe he's also going to talk about a validation study that we are launching this month. Um, we will wrap everything up with a Q&A session so at the very end. So therefore, I would like you to write your questions into the chat, and we will get back to them later. So yes. Welcome again, and I think that's it for my side. Uh, I will give the stage to, to Oscar. OK, hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to, to have you all here today. Uh, as I said, Sebastian, I'm Oscar Ibanez. I'm co-founder and CEO of Panacea. Um, today, I, I will briefly talk about the Skeleton ID, our software for skeleton-based human identification. But first of all, uh, a few works about our company, Panacea. Uh, we are a worker cooperative that joins artificial intelligence and forensic researchers with software engineers with the goal of developing products uh, with positive social impact. After more than 10, year, 10 years publishing articles in academia, you know, we have now funded Panacea, well, not now, in, to, in 2017, to make our research, uh, research useful. No? So that's our goal, no? to move from papers to, to, to products. So well, as you know better than me probably, human identification is a global challenge with increasing numbers due to natural disasters, current and past armed conflicts, shipwrecks, among other uh, issues and, and well, these are some numbers of the missing people or unidentified bodies. Um, you all know DNA and fingerprints are the most accurate identification techniques, but they, they are not directly applicable in an important percentage of these uh, scenarios. And skeleton-based identification is in many cases the only option. So a skeleton ID is our solution for that. The only software applied in artificial intelligence to automate forensic odontology and anthropology techniques. Uh, these methods, anthropological and, and odontological methods, are often, as, as I said, the only alternative, as well as the perfect complement to reduce identification time and cost. However, the tools currently in use are, in some cases, from the last century, and their application is tedious, subjective, and sometimes imprecise. Skeleton ID is, is a revolutionary solution and it provides a new paradigm, a computer-aided a computer -aided paradigm, uh, processing antemortem and postmortem digital images instead of working with the, with the, directly with the bones. It also incorporates artificial intelligence methods to greatly reduce uh, application times while increasing accuracy. So if we reduce time, we allow, uh, we have the possibility to, to do more comparisons. Uh, in fact, this time reduction is exponential in cases of multiple comparisons. If we provide a tool set with a different uh, method, then we can address more cases as the antemortem data could be everything almost, no? a photo, an x-ray, a dental chart, or just the bones. Finally, a Skeleton ID, our software, trace every single action over the digital material and document a lot of variables, providing objectivity, explainability, and traceability. So let's uh, talk about more. Skeleton ID is accessible through a web browser. The software can be hosted in a house, in house or in, on own server or hardware. 
or access via a secure internet connection hosted by Panacea. It consists of independent and in integrable modules that can be divided in the, in the core. Uh, the core is uh, the main part of the software and include transversal functionalities and tools like institution management, reports, mass grave and skeleton inventories, databases with antemortem and postmortem data. And within the core, we can find the virtual lab, which provides 2D and 3D computer graphic tools to perform the different identification methods. And then we have the modules, uh, independent modules integrated into the platform that provides artificial intelligence based algorithm to automatically perform different tasks of each particular forensic odontology and anthropology identification methods. In particular, we are working in the development of four modules, dental comparison, comparative radiography, biological profile and craniofacial superimposition. And well, uh, this last technique, craniofacial superimposition, is what we can find now in a skeleton ID. Dr. Martos will later talk about the technique and how it can be performed within a skeleton ID, so I'm not going to go into detail now. Just one example of how a skeleton ID can provide objectivity to the identification process. On the one hand, sorry, I don't know what happened, with the proper image tools, allowing soft tissue thickness measurement, camera parameter estimation and visualization, etc. And on the other hand, providing the means to fulfill best practices and standards. So on the right side of, the, of this slide, you can see a summary of the morphological evaluation of the craniofacial superimposition correspondence according to MEPROX uh, best practice. Well, on top of that, artificial intelligence, which allow us to compare hundreds of thousands or thousands of cases, rank candidates, and even provide a likelihood ratio of a given comparison. Dr. Valseki will talk about uh, our last achievements in this regards in the last part of the webinar. But as I say, skeleton ID, uh, so as I say, skeleton ID supports now craniofacial superimposition, but we are working in the remaining modules in order to include them within the, this year or the next. So in this slide, you can see a summary of our technology for comparative radiography, which allows automatic comparison of the morphology of antemortem and postmortem bones. The dental comparison will be initially provide different matching algorithms for of odontograms, and in parallel, we are working in the application of artificial intelligence techniques to automate coding of uh, X-rays or identification through the comparison of 3D intraoral images. There will be also a biolo biological profile module, including the state-of-the-art methods. Oh, something happened with the presentation, sorry. Uh, and additionally, additionally in, this, in this field of research, we are collaborating with the University of Granada in the development of fully automatic methods uh, to estimate the age and the sex directly from 2D and 3D images. And finally, uh, this technology can be currently applied not only to the identification of the death, but also of the living. Skeleton ID already allows uh, partial superimpositions, and during the last five years, we are collaborating with different institutions to automate morphological analysis and photoanthropometry. Uh, so one slide, just one last slide related with ongoing research projects applying this technique to the living. In addition to facial comparison, we have two collaborative research projects to try to relate DNA with facial morphology and morphometry. And we have been recently granted with a European project to deal with the age estimation of the unaccompanied minors. So I think that's all from my side. I just want to Thank you all and give the floor to, to Ruben Marto so he can go in deep into skeleton ID and the craniofacial superimposition module. Uh, thank you, Oscar. Uh, the reality is that uh, it's been a pleasure to stay here today with all of you. As Oscar said, I will do a, a brief introduction to craniofacial superimposition technique and the skeleton ID module. And later I will do a quick demonstration of the software with a real case. Uh, so let me share my screen. Uh, 
Okay, uh, craniofacial facial superimposition is an identification technique that consists of comparing and superimposing an unknown skull or a skull to the model uh, with a number of anti-mortem images of a missing person. Uh, it tries to correlate uh, the morphological correspondences in order to uh, in order to determine if they belong or not to the same person. Uh, to do that, uh, the craniofacial approaches make use of homologous craniometric and cephalometric uh, landmarks to guide the skull face overlay process, uh, which means the escalation, orientation, and projection of the skull 3D model onto the facial photograph. In this slide, you can see some of these pairs of homologous landmarks that are the most employed in this process. Uh, once the skull face overlay is achieved, the ultimate goal is to assess the anatomical consistency between the skull and the face uh, in order to determine if they belong or not to the same person. Uh, to do that, the expert must analyze the correspondence of the soft tissue thickness as the homologous pair of landmarks or the morphological and anatomical correspondences between the skull and the face, like the positional relationship between anatomical structure, the consistency of morphological curves or controls or even the presence of asymmetries. Uh, in the last years, uh, the computer identity methods are gaining ground to the traditional video or photographic uh, superimposition methods. And according to Damas et al., there are three consecutive stages for these computer ID methods. Uh, we can differentiate the first stage that correspond to the acquisition and processing of the materials. Uh, we can acquire a SCAR 3D model by means of a 3D scanner or a photogrammetry system. And then we have to place the craniometric and cephalometric lamas into the facial photograph and the SCAR 3D model. And the second stage corresponds to the skull face overlay process. Uh, this is an iterative trial, uh, uh, an error process in which the expert try to replicate the pose of the subject in the photograph with the skull 3D model uh, by translation, rotation, or escalation of the model. Uh, the final stage, they correspond to the decision making. And in this stage, the expert study and analyze the anatomical and morphological correspondences between the skull and the face in order to reach a final identification decision. Uh, as Oscar said, the skeleton ID uh, gives support to these techniques uh, today, and uh, the software is divided into different sections. Uh, the main section or core section is the database in which the, the user can store and manage hundreds of anti-mortem photographs and a SCAR 3D model, and then later will be processed at the virtual lab. Uh, we can upload different, these different uh, resources to the to the database, and we can fill different forms with the relevant information of these cases, like the personal information, the biological profile, or even the dental records. Uh, the second uh, big section of the software is the, the virtual lab. In this section uh, is where we work with the uh, photographs and the uh, skull 3D models to perform the, the skull face overlay and reach uh, the final identification decision. Uh, this section is subdivided into different uh, scenes. We have a 2D scene in which we can work with the, with the photographs. Uh, in this scene, we have tools, uh, auxiliary cross lane to facilitate the, the precise marking of the cephalometric landmarks in the photograph. In the 3D scene, we can establish the front foot plane. We can visualize the skull in for uh, screen simultaneously with the different cranial norms. And we have two uh, auxiliary cross lines to facilitate uh, the precise marking of the craniometric landmarks. Uh, we have a skull face overlay scene. Uh, in this scene, we can perform uh, a manual uh, skull face uh, overlay. Uh, by using the tools uh, for escalation, rotation, and translation of the skull 3D model of the photograph, uh, we can modify to the camera parameters like the focal distance, the subject to camera distance, the principal point, etc. But maybe the most interesting part of, of this scene is our automatic uh, school face overlay algorithm, process SVO, that is able to achieve a superimposition in less than a second. 
Uh, for the decision making st uh, stage, this uh, scene have tools for the evaluation of the morphological uh, correspondences between the scale and the phase. Uh, in this tool, it correspond to an opacity tool to regulate the degree of transparency of, of the scale over the photograph, a wipe tool to hide part of the scale, and even a uh, tool for the visualization and analysis of the soft tissue consistency uh, through conies according to a previous uh, the finance of tissue study. And as regards to the reliability of this technique, we have to say that we are agree with the, the declaration of Carl Stefan. Uh, is that although this technique has been in use for a century, uh, it is currently possible to make film statements about the overall reliability of the CFS method because formal publishes the studies of their accuracy and reliability but have been rare, they have used small samples and often have not been replicated. Uh, for this reason, uh, Panacea is actively collaborating with professionals from around the world, from different institutions, in order to propose uh, reliability studies of this technique uh, that can be later be replicated. Uh, the first uh, of this study uh, it correspond to uh, the when the first of these studies an ongoing study that we are about to finish soon and correspond to the application of automatic uh, craniofacial algorithms for the identification of the leaders and participants of the Polish Lithuanian January of Rising uh, from uh, 1863 64. Uh, this uh, study was made in collaboration with the Dr. Rimantas Hankauskas from the Vilnius University. At the beginning of 2017, uh, human remains were uncovered at the Upper Castle of Vilnia in Lithuania, and Dr. Rimantas Jankauskas' team uh, confirmed that this might be clandestine inhumation of 20 executed leaders of this anti Russian rebellion. And they perform uh, the pertinent DNA analysis for the identification of these individuals. But additionally, to, to the analysis performed by the team of Dr. Rimantas, uh, we can apply a craniofacial superimposition due to the availability of photographs of 11 of, of these individuals and 18 scale 3D, uh, 3D models uh, that involve. Uh, 198 craniofacial problems and more than 200 cross comparisons. Uh, this study was performed under blind conditions and by five different anthropologists from different institutions, the University of Granada, Triste and Tübingen, and all of them following the best practice agreements of MEPROX European project. And to tackle these tasks, they make use of a skeleton ID and the automatic skull phase uh, algorithm included in the software. Uh, the preliminary results of three of these five uh, anthropology are very promising, as you can see in the table uh, below. Uh, these anthropologists provide a final decision in terms of a strong, moderate, or limited support to the assertion that the skull and the facial image uh, belong to the same person, according to the MEPROX scale for the, the decision making. Uh, in around 100 hours, these anthropologists were able to uh, take decisions in 188 cases uh, with a success rate or a percentage of current decision of the 99 or 98%, so it's a high percentage of correct decisions. Uh, I have to say that this, uh, this uh, percentage is in terms of inedit decisions, okay, in terms of positive or negative or undetermined. Uh, uh, these results were compared with those of by DNA uh, by the Dr. Rimantas that provide us with these uh, identification results. Uh, but we have to say too that we uh, face some limitations that have influenced the disidentification process. Um, for this reason, uh, we classify some of these individuals as false positives uh, with a limited support, uh, that is the, the lowest support between the MEPROX scale. Uh, and this limitation corresponds to uh, that we have never had access to the original score or the biological profile information and uh, that it were not visible in the photograph, so we can make a identical co comparison. Uh, several of these photographs were of poor quality for TFAs and we only have one photograph for 10 of the 11 individuals. So, as I say, uh, this influences the, the decision-making stage. 
Uh, no, I, let me change my screen because I'm going to do a, a quick demonstration of the software with a real case. Second, okay. Uh, this is the the cloud version uh, of the skeleton ID. Let me log in the application. As uh, Oscar has said, we have a different main section inside the software. This section corresponds to the to the core of the database section, and we have also the the virtual lab section and the user settings section and the institution settings. And the core section, we can uh, store and manage uh, anti-mortem and post-mortem cases. Uh, we can add uh, the post-mortem cases, filling the, the forms with the information uh, corresponding to the personal information, the biological profile, and we can allow uh, the, the photographs to these anti-mortem cases. The same for the postmortem cases. We can add uh, the postmortem cases with information uh, associated to this case. We can uh, even uh, fill and enter a record and add the attach the different SCAR 3D models. Uh, we can attach this antemortem case and postmortem case to a case file that contains the the type of the information related to the type of, of investigation or a, a scenario and in contain the antemortem and postmortem cases that we want to compare later in the virtual lab. At the institutional settings section, we can define uh, different user roles inside the, the application. Uh, we can define uh, different landmarks to work in the virtual lab and we can create different uh, landmark sets in function of the work we want to do at the virtual lab. Uh, we can uh, create uh, two landmark matches uh, based of homologo landmark uh, for the uh, automatic uh, craniofacial superimposition algorithms to take this uh, pair of homologo landmark into account. We can define uh, soft tissue studies too for example, we have here uh, defined the Stefan uh, soft tissue study for our population. We can introduce the, the data corresponding to the minimum, the mean, the maximum, and the standard deviation uh, for each pair of landmark. Uh, it's important to, to say here that we can define a, a specific uh, population study in function of the cases we want to abort. Uh, we can define two different anatomical and morphological criteria uh, that we want to analyze later in the virtual lab or if we want to classify the facial morphology, for example, and create different sets of, of these criteria too, like uh, with the landmarks. At the user settings section, we can change our password, can change the language, and define uh, the default landmark sets as of this user study or, or the default criteria set that we want to use in the virtual lab. Okay, I'm going to show you now the, the virtual lab. Uh, the virtual lab is divided into different in scenes. We have a 2D scene to work with the photographs, a 2D scene to work with the 3D scar 3D models, and a scar face overlay scene. Let me load one case to show you how it works. Okay, I have here this photograph pre market, but I'm going to create a new Lama location shed to show you how this scene works. Okay, we can zoom in or zoom out in the image and we can move around the image, translate it. But it will be interesting to uh, work only with the facial area in the photograph. Uh, for this, we can use the Select2D Work Area tool 
that made a virtual crop of the image, but does modify the, the proportions of the image. Just is a virtual crop to work in this scene of the lab. And to locate the landmark is so easy, just with a with a right click in the in the zone, the the window with the list is displayed. And just with a click, we can select the landmark that we want to put in the image. As you can see, this landmark appears in the intersection of a vertical and horizontal auxiliary lines that we can um, display to refine the position of the landmark in the image. We can rotate to these lines and we can change the size of the landmark too. Another uh, tool in this scene is the, the evaluation tool in which we can uh, classify the facial morphology in function of, that, of those criteria that we defined previously in the institutional settings. We can take a screenshots too of the photograph if we want to include them into a report. And now let me load a scalp 3D model. In this case, I will show a positive case to show how the, the trigger scene works. Okay, the skulls appear by default in this free camera mode in which we can uh, translate the skull, rotate it, and zoom in or zoom out. We can do this by means of a widget of a roto translation too, uh, as you prefer. Uh, the first step in this thing is to uh, locate the porion, the left orbital and the two porion to establish the Frankfurt place. And with this landmark places, we can have access, we can have access to a four camera view model. In this model, uh, the scale can be translated, can be zoom, can do zoom in, zoom out, but can be uh, rotated. Okay, just only in the in this view here, in this screen of the bottom, is this uh, screen is the same that the free camera, free camera view. As in the same way, uh, uh, well, uh, I forgot to mention that we can uh, flip the, the camera to show the different uh, cranial norms in function of the necessity uh, to mark the landmarks. As the, in the same way as the 2D thing, uh, to place a landmark is so easy, just with a right click onto the model, the, the window with the landmark list appears and we can select one of the landmarks from the list. For example, I'm going to locate La Vela. Uh, if I click at the point, this appears again in the intersection of the vertical and horizontal auxiliary lines. Uh, this line can be displaced uh, around the model, but can surpass the surface of the model. So uh, they are from great utility to refine the position of, of the lama in function of the anatomical uh, structure adjacent. Uh, we can place the lama, in, for example, in the lateral view and refine it in the frontal view. Uh, in this uh, scene, we can take screenshots too, if you want to add them to a report. And now let me uh, choose my pre-market uh, Lamar list to, to show you how the skull face of the scene works. Okay. When the scale 3 d model and the photograph uh, market with all the landmarks, uh, we can access to the scale for overlay scene in which we can perform a manual uh, overlay. We can uh, scale the, the scale. Let me change, me a second to change the sensitivity of the camera to do more quickly movements with the scale. 
uh, we can scale the skull, rotate it in order to try to replicate the pose of the subject in the, in the photograph. We can play too with the camera parameters like the perspective, the parallax, or we can play even with the subject to camera distance or the focal distance. But the most interesting part here, maybe is, as I said before, the automatic uh, school face overlay algorithm process SFO. Uh, I'm going to reset the camera to show how it works. Uh, we have to select previously a, a soft tissue study for the algorithms and when the, the soft tissue study is selected, we can click on the automatic button and select the pairs of homologous lemma that we want the, the, the algorithm take into account. I'm going to keep the endocantium and the exocantium because we have no the soft tissue data for these landmarks. As you can see, the algorithm in less than a second achieved the, the best superimposition um, possible, but maybe sometimes uh, this superimposition uh, uh, we need to refine this superimposition. We can do this uh, with the manually by the escalation, rotation, orientation to refine uh, the screen face overlay achieved by the algorithms. While the, when the skull phase is achieved, we can analyze the morphological correspondence by the school parameters. We can change the opacity of the skull to study the, the positional relationship of the anatomical structure of the contour or morphological curves. Uh, we can use the white tool too to hide part of the cranium of the skull over the photograph. And we can visualize to the soft tissue thickness consistency through a cones tool. Uh, these cones represent the soft tissue data of the study that we have previously defined. Uh, the green fringe, uh, the green thumb of the cone represents the medium plus minus the standard deviation, and the yellow zone represents uh, the the medium plus minus three times the standard deviation. So we can study uh, the consistency of the lamas according to this uh, soft tissue tissue that soft tissue that. Uh, we can use two the evaluation tools to annotate. Uh, to annotate all the criteria that we have analyzed. For example, we can annotate the soft tissue thinner consistency at each pair of homologous lamas. Uh, we can uh, annotate the asymmetries that we are observing, for example, or the positional relationship between the anatomical structure, assigning a grade of support for each criterion that we analyze. Uh, we can take screenshots too to add them to attach them to a report. Uh, now I'm going to show you how the, the reports and the decision making works. To do so, we have to get back to the core set, select the this case files, and in this case file, we can access to the report uh, tool to the, or the report section. Uh, this section show us all the criteria that we have analyzed. Uh, we have here a resume of all of these criteria and the grade of support that we assign to all of them. Uh, the, the screenshot that we have taken from the process and we want to add to the report. And here we can take the decision of positive, negative, or undetermined in base all uh, to all of these uh, criteria that we have analyzed. All the all this information can be downloaded into a PDF a file report that is generated automatically with all the data that we have introduced in the software and in the evaluation process. So you can see here this generated report with the information, the, the decisions, uh, the resume with different tables, and the screenshot uh, added to this report.
So that's all for my for my part. And now I'm going to give the word to Andrea to continue explaining the the future of the CVS module and the new studies that we are going to to carry out. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ruben. I am the next speaker. I am going to share my screen. Great. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, automatization of kind of facial superimposition. Uh, Ruben has uh, just shown you how to use our software and uh, how to perform many operations. Some of these operations must be done manually by a forensic expert. And uh, I'm going to show you what we are doing currently to automate those operations. So uh, the, the usual process of kind of facial superimposition begins by acquiring photograph and uh, 3D models of the skulls involved in the, in the investigation. So uh, this is the step where the automated part begins. And uh, we, want, we, we will be performing many operations under the hood. So I'm, Unknown to the user, we will be locating the facial landmarks in the photograph, the corneal landmarks in the skulls, estimating the pose of each subject in the photographs, estimating the distance from the camera to the subject in all the photographs, and also estimating the amount of soft tissues of uh, each uh, subject. So uh, with all this information, we can uh, perform superimposition automatically. And after superimposition, in the case we are trying to identify um, multiple people uh, among multiple skulls, we can create a ranking of all the candidates. Uh, the software also provides you a matching score, so uh, a measure of the quality of the match of the matching and this allow us to apply kind of facial superimposition to big uh, databases and uh, scenarios when you need to identify multiple victims the ranking that uh, we provide uh, can be used to perform short listing and exclusions and we also are able to compute uh, the likelihood ratio of each possible identification so now uh, let me show you uh, each of the operations that I mentioned before. Uh, let's start with um, uh, the, the landmarking of facial landmarks in photograph. Uh, this is uh, quite a time consuming operation for, uh, for uh, an operator. And um, we have developed a method to do it automatically. This method uh, has been developed by a collective photograph and ask several experts to mark the correct landmark on the face and finally using uh, machine learning and well more specifically deep learning we developed an algorithm that is going to do it automatically um, in uh, our results are quite good we are um, we are able to perform with the same precision as as a human and uh, well, technically, we are we are achieving an error of uh, three pixel and a half on average on the regular size uh, facial photographs. So that's that's the first automatic operation. Then we have the automatic landmarking of cranial landmarks. So in this case, we are working on the on the surface of the 3D skull as it was scanned. Uh, before we, we started the process. In this case, uh, uh, our algorithms uses um, two, two steps. The first, in the first step, we use a template. So we have uh, like an average uh, skull model that had been already uh, marked with uh, the uh, 58 landmarks there are, that we are using in, uh, in this study. This Average model is adapted to uh, any new skull that it's introduced in the system. And after that, we have uh, designed uh, some heuristics 
that uh, locate uh, according to its definition in the most precise ways possible. Uh, for me, this is a nice result because uh, landmarking uh, on 3D scales is quite time consuming. And uh, we have designed the heuristics in the way that uh, we, we, we take a lot of time off the hands of the human experts. In, in our case, the, the results are also quite good. We are achieving an average error of around two millimeters. And this is, again, uh, compatible to human-like performance. Another operation that we can carry out automatically is the, uh, the estimation of the, the distance between the subject and the camera. This is relevant because uh, uh, photographs that are taken close to the subject can show uh, an, a significant amount of perspective distortion. So uh, this helped the, the superimposition process by knowing that the face has been, uh, has been affected by, by perspective distortion. So in this case, we had designed another algorithm based on deep learning, and we trained them with a thousand of images, both real and synthetic. And again, we get uh, very good results. So another operation that has been uh, made automatic is the estimation of the, the pose of the face in the photograph, which again is a relevant information to carry out uh, the superimposition later. Again, uh, this has been studied for quite some time. And uh, we design uh, an algorithm based on deep learning. We trained it with thousands of images. And again, we get uh, very good results and accuracy of three or three or four degrees on the three axis. So we are able to estimate the pose of the face very precisely. Finally, there is the estimation of soft tissue. As Robin mentioned before, soft tissue is a, a key piece of information because we are superimposing uh, the skull with the face. So the landmarks placed on the skull and those on the face are separated by soft tissue. And it's very important to take this distance into, uh, into account. Uh, in this study, we have uh, acquired 500 uh, subjects, well, the data of 500 subjects, and we measured the soft tissue, and we were able to um, train an algorithm to estimate this, uh, this distance automatically. And again, uh, the results are, are quite good. It's difficult to compare this task with a human operator because usually uh, the expert doesn't do that, but we can compare it with average results. Uh, in the sense that uh, the the easy way to perform this estimation is just to say, okay, I'm, I'm dealing with uh, a person from Italy, for instance, like me, and uh, I will check a study of uh, the uh, soft tissue depth of Italian people and use the average value. That would be like the easiest way to uh, carry out this estimation. And uh, our results are better are much better than simply using these average values. So uh, we can claim we get we got good results. Uh, another couple of things. Um, many times in photographs, people are is smiling or they have their mouth open. So one of the issues in kind of facial superposition is uh, how to reproduce the pose of the jaw. We are also addressing this, uh, this issue in our software uh, by allowing the jaw to move and having an algorithm uh, trying different poses of the jaw to find the, the best one, the most appropriate for a specific photo. So in this, in this case, we are able to, to improve our, the, the position of the skull and the, and the jaw by two millimeters. And finally, the last automatic operation is the extraction of uh, information from the photo, from digital photos, like the EXIF data. This is 
especially important in the case of focal distance because that tell us uh, the feature of the lens that took the photograph and allow us to take that information into account. So finally, uh, once yeah, once you have the ability to perform uh, superimposition, well, technically the the overlay part. Uh, automatically, uh, you can perform a lot of cross comparisons. In our case, uh, we validated our algorithms uh, with a set with a set of seventy eight subjects. They were compared seventy eight against seventy eight, which gave us uh, hundreds of thousands of of comparison that luckily were performed by a computer, not by a by a human, and this allow allowed us to uh, to measure the our, the ability of this kind of system and the ranking it it provides to identify somebody in a, in a close set of of candidates so we are we are seeing the results on the uh, on the graph on the left hand side so, no sorry on the right and we can see that by checking at the first candidate in our ranking we have the correct candidate in the 40 percent of the cases okay and after that uh this this percentage of cases in which we can get the correct candidate increases and it gets okay in the worst case you have to look at 50 percent of the candidates but pretty often just by checking a small percentage of the candidates you already find the correct candidates so this results in a, in a very big time saving for the expert when uh, um, when we have a big set of of candidates so this this show us the the utility of of our automated system that it can provide a ranking and this ranking although it's not perfect it doesn't give you the correct candidate in the first position all the time it does it in the 40 percent of the time but the correct candidate appears always in the first part of the ranking and very often in the first few positions so they can say this can save a lot of time for the practitioner when he needs to check a large number of candidates and finally uh, we are about to start uh, a validation study for uh, our system. Well, a new validation study because we already done some of them. Uh, this study will be uh, employing a set of 30 cases. So a set of 30 photos and 30 skull that have been kindly provided by the University of South Florida. Uh, we will be using kind of facial superimposition, of course, following the best practices uh, written by the Mapbox project. And uh, we will be using Skeleton ID, our software, and the uh, in artificial intelligence based technique that I just uh, explained to you. So we are, we are looking for volunteers. So I encourage you to apply for this study. You will be asked to basically uh, landmark photograph, landmark skulls, and perform kind of facial superimposition. Check the the results of our uh, of our algorithms, and uh, and assess the the results. That's that's the, the the core of the study. So that will be really useful because it will advance significantly what we know about. Uh, uh, the position of kind of fascia superimposition and especially it will help us and the community uh, in assessing the performance of automatic kind of fascia superimposition so this is for us and for the community it's it's very important in in my opinion okay that's that's all of my presentation let me uh give the word back to Sebastian for some questions. OK, that comes to the question. Um, what about the marking 
on of landmarks on post-mortem CTs? That's one question we got here. I'm not entirely sure who of you guys is going to answer that one. <clears throat> Andrea, well, I can do it. Uh, well, the, the 3D landmarking algorithm in, in crani craniometric landmarks, uh, first of all, use uh, make use of MESMONC. I don't know if you are aware of, of this uh, open source software. I think uh, it was developed by the people of uh, Leuven, I'm not sure, in Belgium. Uh, or at least part of the team. No? I don't know if Dirk van der Mullen, which is here, or is part of this, or is Peter Kleis. I, I don't remember exactly. But basically, uh, we have... Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is the first part of the process. And for example, in their publication, they use it for facial landmarks uh, in 3D facial models. We are using it in, in 3D skulls. So, uh, and then we have uh, specific uh, heuristics, uh, which this is new or novel from, from this uh, MESMO publication, uh, which are specific for each specific landmark, we have like rules, no? like if the glabella is the most uh, anterior landmark, then uh, we have this rule. No? Uh, so yeah, it can be applied to CT scans, uh, although, uh, there are some uh, texture information that is not available in CT scans, so uh, some of these heuristics are not going to work. For example, uh, those uh, in the, or, or it also depends on the quality of the scan. So, for example, for the, um, uh, well, I don't remember now, but I think there are some heuristics uh, that take into account the, um, I don't remember now the, the English word for that. But well, yes, sorry, but in general, yes. It, we use the morphology of the scan. So we have a template model and, and you can use a CT scan or, or whatever. Yeah. I would like to know the uh, level of 3D scanner. Um, is that economy and requirement of uh, 3D scanners and high-end, uh, and this, uh, this soft needs um, high-end scanners or um, is it um, economic level scanners? 3D scan. It's about the 3D scanner. Sorry, a poor English. To be honest, I'm not sure if I could understood. Also, the sound is not good. I, I don't know. If you were asking about the the 3D acquisition devices uh, required, or it's. Uh, I'm I'm trying to. I will try to answer something, but I'm not sure if I understood properly. Um, the uh, we can you can use a CT scan to uh, you can use a laser scanner or hand uh, not this photogrammetry systems also or we can you can even uh, use a single camera to obtain 3D models yeah. we have an article explaining that in the web page because you can accurate uh, get a 3D model so in the end you you need a accurate 3D model to make proper and accurate decisions. If you don't have an accurate 3D model, you are uh, introducing uh, uncertainty and errors in the whole process. Okay, thank you. And, um, and I was about to answer, well, sorry, to, I'm monopolizing the, the floor, but uh, Asgar was asking <laughs> if uh, any academic uh, study has been done with this software. Uh, so the Ruben was presenting uh, one study with one mass grave in Vilnia. Uh, uh, now I take the opportunity to to say thanks again to Rimantas Jankauskas, because most of the images you have seen uh, were provided by by his team and all the skulls. And yes, this has been an academic study. Uh, we presented, uh, I think, in last. Uh, IICI conference, uh, some in, uh, initial results. Um, we are uh, close to write an article because this study was extended to five different practitioners, one in Italy, one in, in German, in Oscur's lab, and three at the University of Granada. So five different anthropologists uh, have used the software 
in this uh, blind study. Uh, so it will be published hopefully soon. Would a similar algorithm or approach also work for comparing 3D face models to a 2D photograph? Uh, I mean, rather face-to-face -face, uh, instead of skull-to-face? Uh, yeah, the truth is that the, the skull face of the algorithm can be applied to, to the face-to-face uh, -face comparison, of course. Uh, in these cases, uh, we don't have into account the soft tissue thickness uh, because uh, there is an uh, soft tissue thickness uh, comparing a face to a face, but it's uh, applicable, yeah. So yeah, the bottom line is the algorithm works the same way, correct? Actually better, I would say, oh, because the yes. problem is <laughs> it's easier by nature. <laughs> Okay, um, we're coming back to the 3D scanner question. Um, if along the lines of like, how expensive are these devices? And do you want to answer this, Oscar, or should I answer? Yeah, I can. I can say some words in the sense that uh, this is not related with our software. The scan you can use. Uh, well, the, you need a, an accurate 3D model to make accurate uh, lama location, to make uh, uh, an accurate description of the morphology, uh, and to perform an accurate uh, craniofacial superimposition. So if the quality is not good enough, it's as, as I said. So what does it mean? Uh, uh, the, as I said, you can a single camera, which can cost 500 euros, uh, you can create accurate 3D scan uh, models. Of course, it takes more time than with a 15,000 euros scan, but you can do it. Yeah. Exactly. You're basically paying for it with your time <laughs> by processing the images after that and turning it into a 3D model, which is being done automatically by the scanner as well. Well, uh, Dirk is pointing out one important exactly. issue that is happening, uh, unfortunately, in in almost all the studies published that you always have a really small number of positive cases and a lot of negative cases. So uh, the results, uh, you have an imbalance uh, distribution. No? So in the end, it's true that we have a 98, 99% of uh, of uh, good decisions, but as you could as you could see, there were true positive, no? And Ruben explained it as well. Uh, so, but this true positive, uh, well, this this study was a she was explaining uh, it's a binary decision, but in practice, uh, these uh, fail failures wouldn't be ha wouldn't occur in the sense that uh, most of or all these failures were positive uh, identification with a low level of support, you know, because there were only one picture with uh, bad quality and so on. We are now trying to develop, uh, or as Andrea presented, you no know, large uh, reliability studies with medical data, because we have much more cases and we can uh, do uh, better statistics. That's the resolution of the picture influence the reliability. Well, I <laughs> continue. Well, any of us could, could, could reply, uh, of course. <laughs> well, in, in MEPROX, uh, MEPROX was this European project uh, that was uh, going, went going on during 2012 and 2014. Uh, there were some standards uh, people agree on some best practices and standards. Um, the quality and the quali and quantity of the material is uh, the most important thing to give, uh, or one of the most important thing to give an appropriate support. So if you have a low quality, low resolution image, and well, you, you can also refer to, to some standards norms for facial identification that gives you an idea what is a low resolution image, uh, measuring the distance between the the eyes for example so yes uh, low resolution uh, pictures uh, influence the reliability uh, the the best uh, scenario is you have multiple photographs uh, the closer as possible to the death 
uh, if uh, with teeth, you no, know, so in the teeth. Uh, well, I think right now in 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 current cases this is uh, most almost common. No, all, all of us have mobile phones and take a lot of photographs. I have another interesting question. Um, will the program be able to handle the perspective distortion of selfies taken from cell phones? Uh, well, I can answer to this, and th the answer is yes, definitely. It uh, it already takes into account uh, uh, whatever kind of uh, perspective distortion is shown in the in the photographs. So yes, that's an interesting point because uh, nowadays many photos are taken with those kind of devices, and uh, it's it's key to take into account the kind of distortion that they they give. Okay, then I'm going to make a new attempt to, to wrap this up. <laughs> um, one more thing that might be of interest to you. Um, the International Association for Craniofacial Identification is holding an online event on July 23rd in which we are also going to participate. Um, we will include a link to the event uh, when we send you the recording of, of today's event. Um, and, well, I think this is it. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us. And if you have any questions, because somebody was mentioning that, uh, feel free to send me an email and I will make sure I'll forward it to the, to the right person within the organization. Um, well, thank you so much and have a great weekend.